one of the things I talk to folks about when it comes to entrepreneurship is every company is different. Every entrepreneur's journey is different, right? There's no right or wrong answer to being an entrepreneur, starting a business to, again, being an innovator and being in charge of your own destiny, which makes it fun to teach entrepreneurship, right? And also challenging because we're not solving for X here, right? We're just trying to use some basic principles and we're trying to understand the tips and tricks and techniques that one can use to put themselves and their companies in the best position to be successful. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Craig Markovitz. Craig is the uh, founder of Blue Book Technologies, which was later acquired by Smith & Nephew for quite a large amount of money that I can't remember now, but you guys can look it up. And uh, basically, uh, Craig works for the um, Tepper School of Business right now. Um, just a good guy, pillar of the Pittsburgh community. He's given me some mentorship possibly, and I know a lot of other business owners in the area and uh, just people that are doing amazing things today. Craig, welcome to the pod. Happy to be here. Excellent. So I guess, you know, from all the things you've accomplished and what you've done, um, it seems like uh, I have a lot of friends that go and work for the university. What, what made you want to do that uh, after, you know, you kind of get out of, out of Blue Belt? Sure. So I spent 20 plus years working in an entrepreneurial environment, starting companies, working with my co-founders to get Blue Belt off the ground, spent a little time in venture capital in the early days. Cool. And after we sold Blue Belt to Smith and Nephew, just a little over five years ago now, I uh, decided that it was a good time to take a breath and uh, you know, work at a place like Carnegie Mellon, where I'm surrounded by really smart, curious, industrious folks, uh, and try to take a little bit of what I've learned and pass it along to the next generation. And one of our missions at, at Carnegie Mellon and in the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship in particular is to help build the next generation of great entrepreneurs. And being at Carnegie Mellon and teaching some and working as an entrepreneur in residence, gives me an opportunity to meet lots of different folks and uh, understand some very cool technology and try to help. Thanks. I mean, I say thanks because I appreciate the contribution, but that's that's a beautiful reason to do it. Yeah, and I do some other things too, just to sort of kind of close the loop. So when we sold, went to Carnegie Mellon, do some teaching. Uh, I'm a fellow at the RK Mellon Foundation. They started a new initiative around social impact investing. Okay. And it's actually really unique in that they're, they're a foundation and they typically grant funds to other not-for-profits, uh, but there's a little um, sidebar in the IRS tax law that allows a foundation like the RK Mellon Foundation to invest in for-profit companies. Oh, interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through from an IRS perspective, uh, and there's a lot of diligence required from the legal perspective. But at the end of the day, we have a three plus billion dollar foundation here in town that historically has worked with other not-for-profits. That's incredible. Yeah, and now they can actually put money in for-profit companies. and. Uh, the organization has launched a, a pitch competition. It's live right now. You can go to rkmf.org. Rkmf.org. And uh, look at the details and submit an application. It's a short application. It's a video and first prize is half a million bucks. So uh, that's really interesting. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Yep. It gives me fine. yeah no problem. Gives me an opportunity to uh, to again work with other folks and sort of think about social impact as well as how to build a profitable business. Uh, I also work at the law firm in town, Troutman Pepper. I help them with. Uh, a lot of their sort of commercialization strategies for their clients. And that was the firm that helped me considerably when I was going through my adventures with my startup companies. And one thing I learned is it's so important to have mentors, advisors, people that you can Amen. brainstorm with. And they were a great partner of mine. And so now I have an opportunity again to pay that forward and, and work with those folks as well and try to see you know how we can help you know, focus on our mission to build the next generation of great entrepreneurs. That's really cool. So um, I'm kind of embarrassed. I, I wasn't actually that aware of RK Mellon's work here and just the, the size of the endowment and, and some of the things. What kind of companies have, have they invested in, if I can get into that? So I, I may be misquoting myself here, but I think it's the 25 or top 25 foundations in the country and perhaps the world in terms of size. The endowment is yeah. north of $3 billion. That's why I'm embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, they, and they have to put 4% of that to work every year, I think the number is. So they're putting 120 to $150 million out into the community nice. each and every year. And, uh, you know, their focus is, is really on propping up Western Pennsylvania, primarily Allegheny and Westmoreland County, uh, everything from economic mobility to health and well-being uh, and a variety of other initiatives that they have. And, and if you would again, go to their website, their annual reports are there. You can see the types of organizations they support. 
and they just permeate the community. They work with our large education institutions. They work with very small not-for-profits that are community-driven and everything in between. And to the credit of the of the team and the board of trustees there, they're, they're getting more innovative in terms of how they can provide greater impact. And so uh, they look for companies that have viable business models, but more importantly, have a social mission. So the number one factor that the foundation will use to determine whether they do or do not want to explore working with a for-profit company is not, will it be a successful company? Can they make money at it? It is, what is the philanthropic mission? What's the social impact? That's number one. The economics is actually number two, which is totally twisted from how professional investors look at things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I can see an innovation works maybe looking at it that way, but not. Well, innovation looks at jo things like job creation, yeah. right? As sort of number, but they, they are very, very focused on the economic viability of the business. They have to be, it's part of their, their charge and mission as well. Okay. So back to your question, you know, they're building the organization now. It's a new initiative. They have a couple of small investments uh, in a few startup companies or earlier stage companies around town, but really not much to speak of in terms of substance around the portfolio. This pitch competition that's active now uh, with applications, uh, first run applications due September 1st, will be the facilitator for deal flow. We, will, we expect to see many applicants from across the region uh, looking to participate in the competition, try to win uh, investment from the foundation through through the competition, and, and it should hopefully then allow the reach to expand further. So uh, you know, I definitely encourage people to check out RK to look at. We're going to put a link in the description. Yeah, definitely put on the website, check out the pitch competition. Just another example of sort of Pittsburgh being innovative, entrepreneurial, and uh, and supporting the region. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was born here too. I love this town, and uh, anything uh, you know to support it, that's awesome. Yeah. So um, I guess just to kind of go like in a different direction for a little bit, um, when you were working on uh, some of your startups, uh, what was that like on a day-to-day -day level? Because uh, I, th I think a lot of people, um, you know, they, they say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur, but they don't really know what that's actually going to mean from a career sense. Yeah, so so jumping into the world of entrepreneurship, sort of being in charge of your own destiny, right, can be yeah. exhilarating and challenging. It can be terrifying as well, right? Just thinking that, um, and, and and sort of all the whole range of emotions everywhere in between. Um, and so, for, from my experience, when I started, I didn't really start um, that entrepreneurial journey until I was a little older. I was in my late twenties, early thirties. I had spent quite a bit of time working in industry. I'd worked for companies, banks, venture, that sort of thing. And so, I had built a network. I had built a little bit of an understanding for what I was good at and where I needed help, and um, and that allowed me to sort of uncover opportunity. And, and which I think made it easier for me to, to, to make that leap in entrepreneurship because I had that foundation, I had some knowledge and I had a pretty good network of folks Smart. that I could count on. Well, not to say that there's anything wrong with you know, starting in your basement when you're a teenager or when you're right out of school. I, one of the things I talk to folks about when it comes to entrepreneurship is every company's different, every entrepreneur's journey is different, right? There's no right or wrong answer to being an entrepreneur, starting a business, to again, being an innovator and being in charge of your own destiny which makes it fun to teach entrepreneurship, right? And also challenging, because right? we're not solving for X here, right? We're just trying to use some basic principles and we're trying to understand the tips and tricks and techniques that one can use to put themselves and their companies in the best position to be successful. Yeah, well, I don't, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, I don't know it because I've never taught entrepreneurship, but I've worked with a few uh, startup companies and uh, I feel like it's a little bit like herding cats sometimes because you've got these strong personalities, you know, and so, you, you want to show, you know, deference to that, but at the same time, I mean, are, are there any challenges with that? Here? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so there's un, too many challenges to talk about, right? But you know, <laughs> one of the challenges is there's too much to do, not time, enough time and money to do it, right? Amen so you have to prioritize your tasks, right? You have to think about how do you spend your time? You have to surround yourself with great people and people who you trust and who you share your morals and values and you want to work together with, because you know, ultimately, when you're building a business, that's where you're going to spend most of your time. I spent more time with my company in the early days than I do with my family. That's just the reality of how it goes. So prioritizing tasks and understanding the impact and implications of the decisions you make, surrounding yourself with great people, yeah. right? And, and building a culture of camaraderie and consensus and, and hard work. Right? There's a there, lot to be said for that. There's no substitute for it. I, I think if you look at Blue Belt in particular, which was a company that, that uh, Tony DeJoy is an orthopedic surgeon in town, Franco Yarmas, who's a PhD from Carnegie Mellon, and, and myself started together back in 2002. It took us 13 years to get to the exit. And I firmly believe the only reason that we were able to survive the trials and tribulations for 13 years was how amazing the team was and the culture. It's awesome. Uh, and so, so, you know, there's that piece. 
you need to think about you need to think about prioritizing your time you need to surround yourself with great people who you love and trust and want to work together with and then you really have to focus on solving customer problems right so of course you know, when you're an entrepreneur when you're building a product or service you don't want to get caught up in what you've created in terms of what it does right? yeah you want to think about how does your concept your idea solve problems for customers and will they pay you for it right yeah. and so even though you have too much to do and not enough time or money to do it, even though you're working really hard to build a great team, a very high performing team where you can work together and get shit done day in, day out, right? Yeah. And overcome obstacles and deal with problems and dead ends, which is always the case, right? You don't really have anything unless you're solving meaningful problems for customers in such a way that they'll pay you for your solution. Absolutely. And that's where you need to focus, in my opinion, uh, in the early days of being an entrepreneur. You know, be a good networker, be a student of life, uh, really uh, understand your powers of observation. Things that frustrate you, things that frustrate your company, probably frustrate others, right? Yeah. Less than optimal solutions and, and, and other things that you see in your daily life, personal and professional, that aren't working for you, probably aren't working for others. And that represents opportunity to solve problems and build businesses. Nice. Yeah. I almost feel like it's a little bit of a review because that's a lot of the stuff I, when I was going to Carnegie Mellon in the classes, but it's good to have that because it's all true. I mean, having, having been out in the world for a while now, you know, you, you see it and you're like, oh, yeah. Craig was right. <laughs> Every now and then, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah it, that's what it really boils down to. Right? And then you have yeah. to think through the next step, right? So if you can identify a customer problem, you can solve it in such a way that's better than how it's being solved right now. And yeah. there's inclination or some, you get some early indication that people will pay you, right? Yeah. And you gotta figure out how the hell to do it, right? And then you get in that execution piece. One interesting piece that I've noticed is that it does seem like there's a big difference between people saying, hey, I would like that. When can I get one? And signing a PO, a purchase order for the totally. listeners. And so, I, um, I guess, where did that, have you noticed that too? And I guess like, in, do you have any examples that would be? Well, you know, there's a lot of examples, but that, in my opinion, that's the difference between creating something that's nice to have yeah. versus creating something that's a must have. Right? Interesting. And it all boils back down to how acute is the problem you're solving, right? Yeah. So if someone has a real significant problem, right? If they have uh, some sort of robotic technology that isn't working and they don't have the talent to fix it. And they have a big demo coming up with a potential investor, right? And you can walk in and fix it for them, yeah. right? That's, that's, case, that's whole value proposition. That's a must have solution, right? Yeah. If everything's humming along great and you come in and you want to help with some UX in, in interface development, that's going to be an incremental improvement, right? That, that could be a nice to have and they could delay you, right? So it's yeah. a matter of sort of, a lot of determining between what's a must have and what's a nice to have. Well, and I remember we talked a while ago and used the word triage, which I really thought was appropriate for this. And I still use it today when I'm talking about this kind of stuff. So. Yeah, it's, it's the right concept. It's a medical term, right? That, yeah, it is. But, but it, it is absolutely the right concept. It's your most precious resource is your time. Yeah. And how, so how do you spend it for maximum impact? So when you think about building your business, you sort of think, I, I, one of the first questions I ask entrepreneurs when I talk to them is, what's your plan for world domination? Right? What, ideally, what are you going to do? Why are you doing this? Right? And how do you define success? Yeah. All right. So where are you now? And what do we need to do between where you are now and your defined plan for world domination? What are the steps? What are the inflection points? What are the milestones? What's the resource required to get you there? Right? And now you start to frame out what your commercialization plan is, what your development plan is for your company. And hopefully you, know, you can, and it won't go like you think it's going to go, but hopefully it yeah, gives because you. Otherwise everybody would be dominating the world that wouldn't mean anything. Exactly. Yeah. So in and you know, so you have your north star right, and you're starting to move towards it, and then you have you have focus right, and you understand why you're doing it. And I'll tell you, that's a hard thing for entrepreneurs. You had asked me early on some challenges right, thinking about being becoming an entrepreneur, early entrepreneurship, yeah. and and that flipping that switch from sort of planning into execution, conceptualizing and execution, it's really hard for entrepreneurs because if you're sitting around with your friends or your family or yourself and you have an idea for a business. Right? It's all on the table. Every option, every possibility, you can whiteboard, you can put in your notebook, you can do whatever you want, you can think about it all day long. It's all on the table. But once you decide to actually take action right, and move into execution, you have to start eliminating options. Yeah. You have to or have a plan. Money is burning. Exactly. Yeah. You have to have a plan, and that can be hard for entrepreneurs. So distilling your, your sort of overall vision down to something that's actionable, which requires you to triage and leave things yeah. behind and figure out how to move, effectively spend your time. I've had to be do a, big a bunch of times, yeah. Be a big challenge for entrepreneurs, definitely. Uh, it is, but I feel like every time you rise to that challenge, it gets easier. So like, I mean, this is not gonna sound good, but like the first time, you know, I ever had to like kick someone off a project team. I mean, it didn't feel, I was terrified. I didn't wanna do it. 
but then, I mean, now if somebody isn't, you know, performing, I mean, it's, it's not a nice thing, but you know, you're polite, you're professional and you say, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, this isn't working out, you know, hire slow, fire yeah. fast, smart, right? Yeah. That's the strategy. Do you need to find high performing people? You need to build your, your team that want to get you I done. I notice that like when I have people around that are not that, um, I start to get demoralized and it, it, it kind of messes with my psyche and I, I don't enjoy going into work as much. It, yeah. it just erodes the whole thing. So, yeah. you know, it, it, I think sometimes the, the founders or the people that are sort of driving the, the bus from a company perspective think that they are responsible for creating and dictating culture. And it's really not true, right? So the culture of an organization is, is, is created and enforced and evolves based on the people that are there. And so in our company, as we grew, we had an amazing team, incredibly smart, committed, passionate, talented folks that were just very tenacious, wouldn't take no for an answer. We overcame many, many obstacles. That's awesome. And it's just you know, absolutely the, the greatest joy I get when I think about the company and I talk about the company, it is all around the people and what we were able to accomplish together. But when people weren't good fits, right, it was readily apparent to them and to the other folks there. And so you either sort of got, you know, an understanding for how we did things at Blue Belt, um, or you didn't, you didn't last long. And it wasn't as if I had to fire anybody or, or anyone was sort of freezing anyone out or being mean, right? They just, yeah. they just, they just weren't a fit. And you could tell early on whether they were or weren't. And then we would self filter, right? And then we would continue to attract people that shared our perspective and our morals and values and work ethic. And that's how we built this incredible culture that allowed us to persevere for 13 years. That's beautiful. By the way, when you have someone that's not a good fit, I guess, um, do you, do you bring it up immediately? Do you tell them why, or do you, do you usually, you said you don't freeze them out. So I'm assuming there's a dialogue there. Yeah, you have to try, I think, to, to understand the root of the issue and, and, and give folks an opportunity to be receptive to change. Yeah. Um, and so it's not as if you, know, you either you come into a company or came into Blue Belt and we immediately knew, you know, you were in or you were out. Right. And yeah. it was sort of like thumbs up, thumbs down. It, it was an evolution and people were able to change and understand and get on board. And so you know, we worked very hard to keep a, a open lines of communication and, you know, understand what was going on. So many factors. Influence I think that's the right way to do it. I mean, yeah. I've worked at shops and, you know, evolved as a manager, too, where I mean, I've, I've seen it both ways and done it both ways. And I mean, the dialogue is good. I think one thing that maybe hasn't been as good for me as I as I wish it could have been is sometimes in interviews, like the initial interview before anyone's even in the door, I'll say, hey, I don't think this is a good fit because, you know, you're a little bit too junior for this position. I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes, I, I don't know if that one would offend someone's ego, but sometimes somebody seems to get like a little bit like, you know, huffing and puffing and upset and... Yeah, well, no one likes to hear no, right? Yeah, no, exactly. no one likes to No one likes to, to be told that they're not good enough or a good fit. So, but but... I think it's better to, to have those conversations early. You don't do anyone any benefit by dragging it out, right? You're just wasting Yeah, or time. just, I mean, so I guess the, the other school of thought, and again, this is just why I'm devil's advocating here, is um, I, I have some friends that are, you know, have done some pretty good things in industry that have said, um, you know, just don't tell them, you know, why they didn't work out, you know, don't re-engage them. And then, you know, if their skill set gets better in the future, then you won't have closed the door and you can use that person. I, again, I don't know that that's correct. I'm just... Yeah, it's back to my earlier comment, right? There's no formula for this. It, yeah. it, it's it's very sort of situation specific, and so I think it's you're under no obligation to tell someone why, right? Yeah. If they're not a fit, they're not a fit, um, and and that's you know can be good enough. And then you know I, I am absolutely a fan of never burning a bridge, right? I would never tell Same. anyone anything that would uh, you know represent an end of the conversation because you never know. You never know how people are going to come back around. You never know what needs your company is going to have, and so. You know, I think that being open with folks and being sort of quick to making decisions and being upfront with folks really matters. The level of detail you provide around your your logic for your decisioning, again, it's specific to you, whatever your style is. Some people are very close to the vest. Some people are a lot more open. It's just a, a dick, it just sort of depends on your management style. Right? I try to be as open as I can be yeah. as a manager. Um, I mean, I don't want to reveal details that would obviously, you know, compromise any kind of confidentiality or anything like that, but. I think the more details people have, it's like you said, you know, it's not this dictatorship, it's, it's a collaboration. Yeah. And if you empower your people to understand what's really going on, then they can come to the table with stuff you haven't thought of. Sorry, I mean, uh, no, I feel no. like you didn't know that, but. No, it's, but you're right. It's important yeah. to say, right? It, but it, it, it's not uncommon to just get so bogged down in the day to day because there's always so much to do.
and, right. and you know, but sort of taking a breath and sort of understanding things a little more strategically from a higher level perspective, it's important. I mean, why are you doing this and what are you trying to build and, and how do the people factor in, right? Because no one, no one does it alone. I don't care how talented, smart access to resources you have. If there's just no example of, of someone doing something soup to nuts completely by themselves, they've been helped either by co-founders or employees or mentors or you know, pre-existing relationships, whatever they have, right? And so yeah. it, you absolutely need to make sure that you keep that in mind, right? You keep that bigger picture perspective in mind while balancing having to get shit done. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So it, it sounds like there's also, and maybe this is implied, but we haven't talked about it. There, there's this, so when you figure out you want to dominate the world and this is what that looks like, it sounds like you got a you got a basically goal set like it's project management essentially so you're like okay if i want to dominate the world first i need you know a headquarters then i need a military then i need to go invade this country you know that i'm just using that as an mm -hmm. example but uh is that kind of the practice that you you advocate for and you use uh is it a lot of like half stepping and then revision or how do you how do you typically go about that yeah so i am a fan of that type of planning right so the sort of commercialization planning to Think about the pathway, right? And so, yeah. you know, you start with the, we talked about right the other each end of the spectrum, and then you start to think about the the, the meaningful inflection points for the business, right? So maybe get your MVP built and test it with customers, right? Yeah. Maybe that's so okay. So what does that look like? How do I spec out what that MVP is? What type of you know how have I identified and validated my customer segment? What type of data do I need to collect? How am I going to go about doing it? All right, it's going to take me six months, and I need half a million bucks to do it, right? Yeah. And then. Once, assuming that goes well, and even if it doesn't, right, you make your adjustments, you pivot, right, you make your changes, and you evolve, and then, all right, so then we're going to go from there to um, a pilot, right, and we want to do a paid pilot, right, so we get through a sort of early evolution, we get to our MVP, we do our customer validation discovery, we learn a bunch of stuff, we recapitulate the product or service, depending on what's most important to our customers, now we're ready to sort of get something that's a little more commercial ready, so let's run a pilot, right, all right, well, that's going to take us 12 months and 2 million bucks to get that ready. Right. And so, so you can build this plan in your head or even on the whiteboard, right. And sort of think about what the major milestones are, what the progression of your, the commercialization plan for your company is, and then it's going to be wrong. Right. Of course. It's yeah. hundred percent going to be wrong as soon as you do it, but at least you have that guidance and then you make your adjustments. And, you know, we, at Blue Belt, we, we were continually met with obstacles, right? We had plans and, and folks that are around me, you know, I have the, the same sort of joke, smartest comment that I make all the time, which is, you know, when we started the company, I built a three-year commercialization plan to get our technology to market. And it went perfectly. It took 13 years, right? <laughs> and, and that's how it goes, right? And so, you know, you just continue to, to adjust and make changes and listen to the market, overcome obstacles, right? And hopefully you never come up against an insurmountable obstacle. Obstacle. If you do, you have to reassess, but you're going to be met with obstacles. That's why it's important to have a, a really strong team with complementary skills, a good network, a, a, a well thought through plan because you're it's absolutely not going to go like you think and yeah. it's how do you deal with those monkey wrenches that are thrown into the process can you say what some of those were with blue belt or is that stuff we don't want to go no I, we, I could you know i i may start to shake a little bit and i sort of relive some of it but you know, one enough. of our early strategies was we um so that the technology was a handheld bone cutting device uh, and it will uh, use positioning technology and some really smart algorithms to help a surgeon uh, cut complex shapes in bone. And we started thinking about orthopedic procedures, hip and knees, because one of our co-founders was an orthopedic surgeon. And he did hip and knee surgery. Very cool. And that's a great way to do it, right? So we started to think through that, and that's sort of how we launched the company. And then we started to work with um, a group of surgeons that primarily did spine surgery. Interesting. And we got really excited about the potential for the technology to impact spine surgery. So we shifted our strategy and focus and actually started to really double down on spine and it was wrong and how did we find out it was wrong well we we did we did some development work we did some work in the cadaver lab we built the interfaces we were doing and we went to a big conference and we had a booth and we exhibited at a conference and we had all these neurosurgeons orthopedic surgeons that specialize in spine come through a booth demo our technology talk to the team and it became apparent almost instantly that it was a nice to have technology for the procedure we had targeted, ah. right? And and so even though surgeons thought it was pretty cool and you always had these early adopters that want to play with new technology that were ready to go. Oh, a lot of surgeons are. The vast majority of folks that we talked to, they were like, man, you know, and we started to ask questions, would you use it? How would you use it? Again, nice to have. And so we had to shift back 
to orthopedics. And we ultimately, our first product actually that was released into the market was for partial knee replacement surgery. Oh, cool. So we started in hip and knee. Is that the stride? Uh, that's the implant. Stride was the implant, right? Navio was the system, was the robotic system. All right. For some reason, I thought Navio Stride was the branding. And, uh, so I'm when we when we, when we we launched, the robot itself was called Navio. Yeah. We had an implant, a partial knee implant, which was called Stride. That's so cool. You use a robot to shape the bone. The Navio system shaped the bone to implant the Stride implant into the patient. But that is an absolute example of we veered off our strategy. We thought it was the right decision. We put resources towards this spine idea. When we realized we were wrong, we pivoted back into our bread and butter, which was hip and knee, ultimately focused on knee. Smart. And th that is absolutely an example of sort of the meandering path that an entrepreneur can take. Yeah, it's it's difficult to do that. I mean, I have a location that I work at with too expensive for us projects there that I've had to pull the plug on just because, you know, they weren't going to make money. And, you know, you put in, you know, thousands of hours and dollars and, you know, all sorts of resources. And I mean, there's an emotional want to not, not pull the plug on something like that. But, you know, then, you know, you look at the books, you know, this is suicidal to the company. We can't do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, those are hard decisions to make, right? And that, again, that's why you don't do it yourself, right? You have folks that you trust, mentors, your board members, co-founders, colleagues, right? Where you can sort of work through the implications, what it means, and, and you don't give up. Right? Entrepreneurs don't give up. You just figure out a new way. Yeah. Right. You know, one of the things that that characterized our company was we we just were not going to give up. We were not going to give up. We weren't going to let each other down. We believed in our technology. We believed in the company, and we were going to do whatever it took um, to take our best shot. Nice. Yeah, it seems like a beautiful kind of words of wisdom there. Honestly, I feel like we could end on that, but I, I want to ask you so many more <laughs> questions. <laughs> That's fine. You know, I, the short attention span syndrome a lot of entrepreneurs have, right? So, yeah, you know, sure. whatever, however you want to do it, I'm fine with it. Let me see if anything else comes. Um, How did you find your initial founding team? Great question. And back to the net, the importance of networking. So um, without getting into too much detail, I was living in Pittsburgh, and then I moved to Philadelphia to work in venture. Uh, this is during the dot-com days, so I was chasing my, my dot-com fortune. And uh, when the bubble burst, moved back to Pittsburgh, uh, she's going on about 19 years ago. And uh, when I came back trying to figure out what, what I was going to do next, reactivated my networks and folks that I had knew, known from some previous work I had done and that I had stayed in touch with. And um, timing was such that there was this cool technology that was under development at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And they asked me to come and take a look at it. And we started to put our heads together. And then those two folks ended up being my co-founders. At Blue Belt, so they were in the Carnegie Mellon project. Yes, they were advisors to PhD students. Cool, and uh, and you know, and it's probably a good time to take a quick aside and talk about that founding team and talk Absolutely. about founding teams in general. So, you know, when we started the company, we had um, what at Carnegie Mellon and the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship uh, under Dave Mawinney, uh, we talk about the perfect founding team, which is a hacker, a hustler, and a designer. Okay. <laughs> And so and Sean Amarati used those words. Yeah, that Sean Amarati, he's part of the ecosystem there too. Him right? and Dave. Right are, yeah. yeah. So, so there's lots of places we quote that all the time. And so you know, the hacker is the technical person that can get, you know, build things and write code. Um, the, the hustler is the business person, right? That can raise the money and sell the product and make sure that the lights stay on and those paycheck bounces. And the designer is the UX person, right? The customer experience person, right? So if you have those three different skills that can come together in a complementary way, you really have this sort of perfect confluence of founding talents and skills, right? The hacker, hustler, designer. And I think for, that's, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, for Blue Belt, yeah, if I was the hustler, because I came out of, I, of the business world. Dr. DeJoya was the designer. He was the orthopedic surgeon. He was the customer. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. Yarmez was the, the hacker. He was the PhD. He was the technologist. And so we had that perfect complement. So you know, that's, that's the, the network that I had built over the course of my career led me to this opportunity, led me to working with people who I knew and who I trusted and were extremely talented, right, to build this you know, great complement of co-founders to get the company off the ground. That's really cool. So, so be a strong networker, right? Yeah, that sounds like it. And be willing to work with others. I mean, like, I mean, not to talk too much, but I know when I was a kid, I mean, I, I was building stuff since I was seven years old and I, I had a, like a locker alarm company in middle school and I was constantly trying to be an entrepreneur, even though I wasn't very good at it, like my whole childhood. And, um, 
one of the things that really held me back was that I just wasn't good at working with others. I mean, I, I was very, uh, you know, it's got to be my way, you know, the color has to be exactly this, or it's got to happen this way. And um, I mean, I, I put forth a lot of effort to, to break that because, you know, you can't do anything when you're just one person, like you said. Yeah. You can do some stuff, but you're not going to get very far. No, it's interesting, Spencer. So that brings up another point, right? So all those sort of lessons that we've learned over the years um, is, is you know, sort of this this idea of, you know, your ability to work with people and, and actually putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, right? A characteristic of an entrepreneur is to get out of your comfort zone, right? And that, because that forces you to build your skills, that forces that. you to do different things, forces you to meet new people, right? And so when I talk to entrepreneurs, and it becomes apparent to me that they're comfortable in a particular area, right? Whether they're technology focused or market focused or sales focused. And I try to push them to think about moving into other areas and trying new experiences that'll help their company to get them out of their comfort zone. Because you, as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, you absolutely have to push yourself and get yourself out of your comfort zone. So kudos to you, right? You can recognize that was something that, that you needed to work on that was uncomfortable for you, but you did it anyway, right? Yeah, it had and, to be done. And it matters. And th those sort of things matter. And these are all the different factors that you put in your favor to put yourself in the best position to be successful, all right? There's no guarantee. There's no, no one can pick winners. Yeah. Anyone that comes on your show or anyone that anyone talks to that says they can tell you whether a company is going to be successful or not is not telling you the truth. I can you cannot agree. pick winners, right? But what you can do is you can build your skills, build a robust network and put yourself and your company in the best position you can be to be successful. Yeah. Now, another thing I've noticed, and I, I, we can steer away from this topic if you want, but is Obviously, you know, 95% of product companies fail is the stat I've heard. I don't know if that's different or been manipulated since then, but um, how do you handle it when you know a company is not going to do well? Because I have, okay, so for instance, like, I mean, I've, I've clung on to ideas like Captain Ahab where it just wasn't going anywhere and there wasn't a viable pivot. And, um, you know, that's obviously not the smart move. Pivoting, as you mentioned, is, is awesome. And, and, you know, the, the way that you did it with spine to knee, I mean, you know, Enough for your box. You're doing great, and so um, I should say they're doing great since you you got out they're of there. Great. But yeah, but um, I, I guess I, I've known quite a few entrepreneurs and had you know dozens of clients where you know they they ran out of financing and they just couldn't do it anymore. And I've noticed in some cases, I, I think because of this, you know, teaching or mentality, um, you know, that you have to make it. You know, there's there's this embarrassment embarrassment you know there's a shame there's you know like i can't fail you know not me you know and so what will happen is a lot of these startups clients will just will just ghost and, and you'll never see them again because they cannot bear to tell you that they're out of financing um and then i know other people that have been in that position um with companies that you know everybody was excited about um you know decent financing not huge like like a like a high seed like maybe like one or two million and um you know, they've gone ahead and returned the money because they realized that the idea wasn't going to be profitable. Um, and so I don't know what your thoughts are on that or if that's something you want to get into. I'd just be interested to... Well, it's it's, it's hard to, to make blanket statements around this, of course. Yeah, and, and, and it is an emotional right. thing. Yeah. Everyone takes things differently. But I can tell you one lesson that I learned and, and you know, I, I am... Uh, I try to be a good student of life in the world. And when people talk to me and give me ideas and perspectives, I try to listen and remember things I think that are helpful. And, and so I actually um, would use a quote that uh, was given to me by one of my early investors in Bluebell, who said to me, nothing kills a company faster than ego and greed. <laughs> right? And and what Amen. you just described, right? This idea that you know, they don't want to be up front, tell folks that they're stubborn about facing reality, you know, that, Again, we can't predict winners. And so who's to say whether they're hanging on? It's not for us to say whether someone's hanging on too long or, or ghosting you and being stubborn. Like, we don't know what path they're going to take if they're going to be successful, but you absolutely have to check your ego at the door, right? And you have to think about, again, you know, why are you doing this? For whom are you doing this? Who is your customer? All those sorts of important factors, right? So, um, but when you start to get into these, well, I can't fail, I don't fail, you know, that is an ego thing and you have to, be, hum and you have to be humble and you have to recognize that. Um, you know, sometimes things will work out like you hope, and sometimes they won't. And and being able to deal with the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, is an important characteristic of being an entrepreneur and an innovator. So so I would say, you know, check your ego at the door, right? Make the decisions Amen. based on the facts, based on the decisions based on what's best for your company, yourself, your customers. Uh, and the greed thing is, is you know, you know it's self-evident, right? You know, if, if you treat people well and if you're fair and reasonable, 
um, you know, things will come around in your favor. If you're continually sort of focused on yourself uh, and you're maximizing your benefit at the expense of others, that's going to go against you in this idea to do everything you can to put your company in the best position to be successful, right? So, you know, don't have a big ego, don't be greedy, focus on the things we talked about, and that will give you the best chance to be successful. That's a, uh, that's a beautiful thing and very true, by the way. I mean, those lessons, at least for me, it took a while to find, but, uh, yep. Well, listen, I'm we're all, still I'm still learning. learning. We're all still yeah, learning. Actually. Actually. Just how it goes. It's a process. I, all right. Um, maybe that's a good note to add on. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. No, it was great. I appreciate the time and, and I do I hope appreciate that... your time. Every time I get to talk to you, it's, it's yeah, a lot it's of cool. fun. No, I'm glad yeah. to do it. And, uh, hopefully folks will get onto that arcade thing and check it out. And, you know, yeah. Uh, by the way, before we, before we cut anything else you want to plug? No. I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess uh, maybe one other thing. So, ignition you know, did, plan? huh? It's an ignition plan. Yeah, I haven't decided what I'm doing with that yet. So right. I'm still noodling with it. Um, but so, in addition to having folks check out the the RK Mellon uh, pitch challenge on the website, you know, as we the world gets back to whatever normal is going to be and campus reopens uh, at the Schwartz Center for Entrepreneurship in Carnegie Mellon, uh, we will start in the fall our programs. We back up and hopefully in person. And so uh, I would uh, hope that folks would go to CMU's website find the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship, sign up for our weekly bulletin that comes out every Friday, news, events, we have activities running through the center all through town. So you know, it's a great opportunity to reintroduce ourselves to each other yeah. and uh, you know, get back out there. Well, I like popping events. into those Connects classes even now. I mean, I think Sean must have done like five double takes at me when I popped into one of his, like he'd seen a ghost from his past. But Yeah, so Sean, does, so we all do them and, and they're very well attended, they're very educational. They're, we have subject matter experts come in over lunch and they talk about everything from business model canvas to business insurance to intellectual property strategies, you name it. It's really cool. It's like, yeah. great. It's free. It's a great networking opportunity. It's great to pick up some knowledge. People that have actually done it are teaching these classes too. So you don't get pretenders. You don't get some academic that's never been there. These are people that have started successful companies and finance successful companies that are telling you how they've seen it work. Yeah, it's totally experiential. So, so you know, at the end of the day, I'm really happy to be here and talk a little bit about my experiences. And the two things I would ask folks to check out would be rkmf.org, go to that pitch challenge, check it out, go to cmu.edu, get to the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship website, sign up for that weekly bulletin. It's an connected. exciting seed round. I mean, that's like a, that's like a West Coast seed. That's it's, it's 500K first, 300K for second, 200K third. Nice. Um, so it's, you can actually do something with that. Totally meaningful. So um, great. Well, glad we could we grab pull this off. Then. So, yeah, thanks for coming in. Yeah, my pleasure. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.